opens fire on a sheriff's deputy just north of San Francisco. ICE has confirmed the gunman who died in the shootout had been deported three times. It's dramatic stuff as we say welcome to our number two on a Friday. I'm Bill Hammer live here in New York and welcome back to you, Heather. Not done yet. I'm yes. Heather Childers in for Sandra Smith. You know, California sanctuary policies allowing that suspect to evade immigration authorities for years. Despite a lengthy arrest record, ICE issuing detainers with local jails four times, none of them honored. And the terrifying gunfight in Napa County captured on body cam video. Put the spotlight on the 2017 California Values Act. Now, critics call that a sanctuary law, and immigration officials say it's exactly the kind of law that prevented them from previously arresting and deporting requests to hold the arrested person for longer so that ICE can begin deportation proceedings. The detainers were after arrests related to DUI, battery on a peace officer, selling liquor to a minor and unknown probation violations. None of those detainers was honored by jail staff at the Napa and Sonoma County jails, according to ICE officials, who said in a statement, quote, ICE is grateful the deputy involved in this shooting was not harmed during this attack. It's unfortunate that our law enforcement partners and the community are subjected to dangerous consequences because of inflexible state laws that protect criminal aliens. Now, the California Values Act essentially prohibits local law enforcement from cooperating with federal immigration officials, keeping illegal immigrants arrested on relatively minor offenses in jail at the request of immigration authorities or asking those arrested about their immigration status. The sheriff is just glad his deputy is alive. When you're in that situation, uh, when you're in a gun battle, uh, you want to win. And she did, she did beautifully. She did what she was trained to do. So the bottom line here, Bill, is that local law enforcement are proud of the work one of their own did to take down a dangerous habitual criminal, while federal immigration enforcement saying it never should have got to the point where a deputy could have lost her life. Bill? Tough stuff. Jonathan Hunt, thank you. Live in L.A. today. Thank you, sir. Sure. Wait for it. <laughs> One hour ago, Democrats putting forward their resolution to block the president's declaration of a national emergency at the southern border. I want to bring in our A team right now. He is Juan Williams, the Juan Williams, one in a million. Fox News political analyst, co host of The Five. She is Shelby Holiday, video reporter for The Wall Street Journal. And he is back with us, David Asman, anchor of Bulls and Bears on the Fox Business Network. Good morning. Good morning. Great Good morning. panel. Juan, by the way, he's working the refs already. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't yeah. understand working how, the refs. Here we how did go. we get purple ties in LA? And and New York on the same morning. That's a good, good question. Very it curious. It was like a violent kind of day. You've been on fire on the five, by the way. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, really it. good. But you can't work the rest when you walk in the studio. Now. Well, it's four against one. <laughs> David, what about, this, what about this border fight here? Uh, make some well, what you did, the report that we just saw really highlights why border security is extremely necessary. I believe in walls. I, I, I saw what happened in San Diego where uh, they decreased the number of, of those captured, illegals captured by 95 percent after they built a wall. I mean, walls work. Uh, but I have to admit, I do not like it when a, when a president declares national emergency. I don't like it uh, when President Obama got very close to doing that with DACA. I know that's not exactly what Obama did with DACA, but it was very close to it. It, it empowers the executive to, extent, to an extent that makes me nervous. That's why I'm a little wary of the declaration of an emergency here. I think we're very close to an emergency, but we got a deal. Let's see how the deal works out. It's not as much money. It should be there for a wall. Uh, but let's see if, if we get to, to make progress on border security because of this deal uh, before the declaration is actually put you in place. You might have more in common with Juan than you uh, thought. In the, in today I do, I think, uh, yes. Go ahead, boss. Well, I mean, obviously the difficulty here is in the Senate, not in the House. I think it will pass in the House where you have a Democratic majority. In the Senate where you have a Republican majority, you really are talking about the concerns expressed by David Asman, which is that if you empower the president to this extent, uh, you really are imposing on the authority of the U.S. Congress, which is supposed to be the branch of government that appropriates funds. And here the president is literally going around the Constitution to take that power away. You would need four Republicans in the Senate 
uh, to vote for this resolution of disapproval. Susan and Collins says you'll probably vote mm -hmm. with Democrats if you get three more. Then well, I mean, perhaps the, you get a veto from the president. And it's, well, it's, that's it's where all I was going with this. But I would say that when you see people like Mitch McConnell, when you see the number two, John Cornyn of Texas, people like John Thune express concerns, you understand the president has put himself in a very tenuous position with Republicans. Shelby? Well, one's right. It'll have no problem in the House. In the Senate, we've already heard a number of Republican senators speak out against the, against the national emergency declaration. The question is whether or not they would vote, break with their party, and vote with the Democrats. But this is holding their feet to the fire. If they do take a vote, because the president is likely to veto it, so it's a symbolic vote. It doesn't not necessarily mean it will do anything. But now they're on the record saying we oppose or we support it. So it'll be interesting okay. to see who. All right, who let's comes out. Get, let's go back to Chicago, okay? And this is a story that's really <clears throat> captured the imagination of the country for better or for worse. Uh, Tim Scott earlier today, the Republican senator from South Carolina. Watch what he said. Anytime you try to weaponize hate through false accusations, it is awful. It is despicable. And frankly, if you want to look at hate in a real manifestation of hate, look at UC Berkeley's campus, what happened to a conservative just trying to find a way to bring more, attract more conservatives. What he's referring to is this incident caught on camera there out in Berkeley. But bring it back to Chicago. This is a man who allegedly weaponized race and weaponized sexuality. And that's what had the police chief, Eddie Johnson, so hot on fire. That's right. And, and, and you know, when I, I love what Tim Scott said. And he, because people like Kamala Harris, who, of course, was hemming and hawing uh, for most of yesterday, when she finally got down to saying something about uh, what the police chief said, she said, uh, uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that the number of hate crimes in America is increasing. But does she include, for example, uh, what happened to the Covington High School boys uh, when they were out protesting and approached by uh, that, that black nationalist group that, that said the worst kind of hateful things towards them and led to the confrontation that was misinterpreted so widely in the media. That, if you're going to say that what happens to a lot of, of minorities in America's hate crimes, you've got to say even if it's a, a white boy from Covington, uh, getting the same kind of talk and garbage thrown at him, that that's a hate crime as well. I think Kamala Harris, as she's trying to expand uh, her universe of voters, of mm. potential voters, if she runs for president, she would go a long way in including okay. hate crimes against people who happen to have voted for Very Donald Trump. Yeah. We got some breaking news. I just want to pause here a moment on our conversation. Okay, let's get to this now, Heather. Yeah, that's Fox News alert for you. Another violent Friday in the Middle East with Hamas threatening to ramp up its protest at the Israel. Who's going to get out of there for the moment and get the safety so uh, be well over there back with our panel now here in New York Juan and Shelby and David I, I think the next seven days is going to shape up in a very significant way for this White House you could have the Mueller report mm -hmm. maybe today maybe next week perhaps the days after mm -hmm. you're gonna have Michael Cohen testify before a House Public Committee on Wednesday on the same day that Chairman Kim and President Trump meet in Hanoi. Uh, here's what Jim Jordan, who's the ranking Republican on the committee, said. Giving a platform to Mr. Cohen is beneath the dignity of the Congress, and I'm sad that Democrats have sunk so low as to promote an admitted liar just to satisfy Tom Steyer and the political forces on the left who will settle for nothing less than impeachment. The charade is an affront to our committee's constitutional obligations. He calls it a charade for Cohen's testimony. Perhaps it continues. Perhaps it's delayed. What do well, you think about the next seven days, Shelby? I agree with you. It'll be a tremendous seven days. We don't know what's coming from Mueller. We don't know what Michael Cohen will say publicly, um, how that meeting with Kim Jong-un will play out. Uh, the other side of that coin, we heard from Jim Jordan. I think that's a fair point. The other side of it is Elijah Cummings saying, we have a duty to conduct oversight of the executive branch, and we want to know very specific things. We want to know about those hush money payments. We want to know about Trump's compliance or noncompliance with tax laws. They want to know what happened over the course of Michael Cohen's tenure working for President Trump. Um, they have a lot of questions. His, Trump's conflict of interest, for example, they've released uh, what, what, a list of what, things uh, that they Elijah want to Elijah Cummings about. has said is they want to talk about the payments. Yeah. He said it's going yep. to be a little more limited in scope. And that, will be, and that will be focused on what happened during the campaign, which I think is a relevant exercise of oversight of the executive uh, I branch. think once you hand it over to the lawmakers, who knows where the questions are going, right? But they don't, right, right. exactly. And you don't know. He's cleared to talk about certain things, but you don't know what the questions yeah. are. Yeah. He can't control them. So we'll see Jim how Jim Jordan, goes. amongst some of those who have said they're not going to stick to those parameters because they think that they should be expanded well I think you I mean it's it's open I mean you can ask anything you like but the the issue is in this seven-day period as you were talking about uh, I think that we are in for you know stormy waters here uh, I don't see how the president responds 
He's going to be in Vietnam. It's a different time zone. It's going to be very difficult. Uh, middle of the night, I guess he'll be watching to see what's said. But you can't say, as Jim Jordan did, that it's somehow extra legal or beyond the bounds of the Congress to have Michael Cohen testify. Maybe he should say that to the Senate. The Senate's going to have Cohen testify as well. Behind it's not only you know, oversight, I guess the point is you don't have to do it next Wednesday. Wait, wait a second. Wait he, he was the home. one who, who delayed it. He, he was scheduled to have appeared earlier. I would recommend everybody read Kim Strassel's piece in the Wall Street Journal today in which she says that what's happening now is as the Senate Intel Committee, both the Republicans and Democrats on that committee admitted there was no collusion. The original charge of collusion fell flat. So Adam Schiff, head of the House Intel Committee, is going to push it to phase two. Shifting to phase two of collusion is, is, is the way Kim Strassel puts it. And that means focusing on stuff that is so far removed from what the president did during the campaign or even uh, as president, uh, going back to his, his business dealings before he even announced that he was running for president. I mean, they're going to look for all kinds of stuff because the Senate Intel Committee really shot down the collusion charge. So we're heading into something else. And whether or not the people are going to believe somebody like Michael Cohen, if that's all they have to hang their hat on, uh, I think I think it's it's an open question, but frankly, you, you consider his track record, and I I wouldn't uh, trust you him mean, as far as I can throw it. Are you talking about? Are you talking about? Are you who are you talking about here? Cohen or Trump? Cohen. About lying? Michael Cohen. Lying? Michael Cohen. Oh, okay. Yes. Mueller's Thank report's you. not out, so it's not over to Nice to see you all. See, that was pretty fair, wasn't it? <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> excellent. Uh, Look at you. Yeah. Thank you, Juan. <laughs> Thank you, Shelby. Thank, Thank you, you, Dave. Absolutely. <laughs> White House now changing strategy in Syria. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a moment with Senator Lindsey Graham, our headliner in studio. Talk about that and also North Korea. So a long list for mm -hmm. Senator Graham coming up. Plus, a woman who was born in New Jersey and left Alabama to join ISIS now wants to come home. And the White House saying no. Now her family fighting back. We'll talk about it with a former assistant U.S. attorney, Andy McCarthy, up next. So she, and as an American citizen, Huda herself and her family simply want to face our legal system. She's willing to pay whatever debts she has to society. She's even willing to spend years behind bars if that's the debt she owes. Well, that is the attorney for the woman who left America to be an ISIS bride. She was on our show yesterday. Uh, his client, Hoda Mathana, wants to come back with her son, but the Trump administration has barred her from reentering, saying that she's not a citizen. Her father pushing back, filing this lawsuit in federal court. A former assistant U.S. attorney and Fox News contributor Andy McCarthy joins us now to talk more about this. Nice to see you. So you heard the sound there. He you. says, you know, she's willing to face the legal system. Do you think she should be allowed that opportunity? If she's an American citizen, she has to be allowed that opportunity, assuming that she can get herself to a port of entry. But the burden is on her to prove that she's an American citizen. I think looking at the lawsuit that she filed, if the claims that she makes can be established, she's got a pretty good case that she's an American citizen. I think what she doesn't address is that it, it's not just a matter of when her father, who was a diplomat for uh, Yemen, mm -hmm. was discharged as far as Yemen was concerned from his, uh, from his diplomatic status. The issue is when did the Department of State change his status from a diplomat to a lawful permanent resident, and we, and we just don't know the answer to that. And the importance of that, of course, is if she was born when he was a diplomat, the State Department, I think, is right that she's not an American citizen. Uh, if not, then she probably is. And they're claiming she was born a month later after he gave up his diplomatic status, and that there's a passport to prove that. Yeah, well, the issue, though, is not, you know, it's not up to the person and the foreign government if you get to come to the United States as a diplomat, you present your diplomatic credentials, mm -hmm. it's up to our State Department when you stop having that status. Mike Pompeo called her a terrorist. He was pretty firm yesterday in his response. Here is part of what he's saying about this now, yeah. Andy. Watch it. This is a woman who inflicted enormous risk on American soldiers, uh, on American citizens. She's a terrorist. She's not coming back. President Trump made clear uh, that she wasn't coming back. She's not a U.S. citizen. She is not entitled to U.S. citizenship. She's not coming back to our country to pose a threat. So if they can prove otherwise, as you spell out, she was born in Hackensack, New Jersey. Her father was a diplomat from Yemen, and her side is claiming that 
his status here had changed a few months before she was born. That's that's the whole case. If she were to come home, yeah. think, think about the evidence they have against her, Andy. If she were to stand trial, how does she defend herself? Well, it looks like a very strong case, Bill. And my point is, I think the I don't think the Justice Department should wait around. I think they should indict her right now. It looks like it's a pretty strong treason case, pretty strong material support to terrorism case, actual terrorism conspiracy case. Um, she should know that if she comes back here, she's facing the prospect likely of decades in prison. Yeah, and not so, only, not you know, only did she... And if she wants to roll the dice... I was going to say, not only did she marry this one uh, ISIS fighter, she married three. Her son, who she wants to bring back as well, uh, was born by one of these ISIS fighters. And there's evidence before she even went over there to Syria, she used social media under aliases to call on other people, Americans, to run over people in trucks and cars. She even called for the death of uh, President Obama. Yeah, Heather, the last part that you mentioned, the the active things that she did on behalf of uh, not only pushing the ISIS agenda, but actually calling on jihadists to mass murder Americans is the big problem that she has. Um, you know, all the other stuff, going to Syria, marrying uh, ISIS guys, that's problematic, but it's not nearly uh, the, the problem of mm -hmm. actually becoming an active member of the ISIS cause. Um, uh, Andy, one more point here. Do we have soundbite number one queued up, guys? Back to the attorney who was with us yesterday. Uh, here is Hassan Shibli making a case that she could be a valuable asset for U.S. intel. Watch. I'm suggesting that she may have very valuable intelligence that the United States government can benefit from. We have a legal process, and she's not asking for a free pass. She wants to turn herself in and be held accountable to our laws. We don't need to circumvent our, uh, our laws. Our laws are great. Let's stand by them. Okay, so they're going to fight this. How is this decided, Andy? It is such a peculiar case. Well, I think the way it's decided, Bill, is the Justice Department should go about the business of indicting her. It's on her to try to get herself to a port of entry if she actually wants to uh, test this. I think they'll let the case go forward in the court. The court will probably say that these people have standing to get a, a final judicial read on what her status is. And then I, I, I just think we should let the process work itself out. I wish uh, Secretary Pompeo was right that the mere fact of being a terrorist would be enough to keep people out of the country and the fact that you should that you levy war against your own country to my mind that ought to be enough yeah. in effect to renounce your citizenship but unfortunately the supreme court hasn't seen it the way i do uh, so we'll have to play the process thank out. you andy i really appreciate you coming in today apparently there are dozens of americans like her being held in northeastern syria we'll see where all their cases goes thanks andy got some breaking news right now come yeah. on back thank you Thank you. Got a Fox News alert right now. This is an update now on the Jesse Smollett matter from the Fox Studio Public Relations Division. The executive producers of the hit show Empire released a statement a moment ago. Reading now for the first time, here is the quote. The events of the past few weeks have been incredibly emotional for all of us. Jesse has been an important member of our Empire family for the past five years, and we care about him deeply to avoid further disruption on set. We have decided to remove the role of Jamal from the final two episodes of the season. End quote. Again, from part of our company here at Fox, that statement coming from the PR department just a moment ago. So he has been suspended from the next two episodes of this season, the latest on Jesse yeah. Smollett. And we'll be interesting. The wheel, the wheel that turns yeah. in Chicago. Will, will he get paid for those last two episodes since allegedly that had to do with why he did all of this to begin with? Now, we watched the police chief yesterday, right about this time, 24 hours ago, and he, he delivered under no uncertain terms about how he felt, about how deeply offended he was as a person in America and also in the community of Chicago. Yeah, very passionate. All right, passionate. 27 past the hour now. We roll on. Yeah, coming up, Democrats uh, taking some new action to fight President Trump. What they just did today to stop uh, an attempt to end President Trump's emergency declaration, or actually that's what they did. Also, Heather, the president's second summit will go down only days from now. The two sides trying to reach a deal on nuclear weapons. Will they get there? We'll dig into both topics with our headliner, Senator Lindsey Graham, is live in studio next.
continue to be in communication with them. At the end of the day, the president wants to bring our troops home, and he's working towards that. He wants to do that in a uh, safe and peaceful way, in the best way possible, to make sure that we have complete safety for our troops. And here. Thing. You, you were not happy about the initial call to get 2,000 out. Now it appears about 200 will mm -hmm. stay. What do you think of that call? I think it's a very smart decision by the president. <clears throat> he listened to sound military advice. He adjusted his policies. The goal is to make sure ISIS doesn't come back. If we'd have kept troops in Iraq, we would never had ISIS. Mm -hmm. Now that the caliphate's destroyed, and it really has been destroyed, congratulations, Mr. President, on making that happen, this 200 will attract probably 1,000 Europeans. You've got to remember, thousands of Europeans were killed by ISIS fighters coming from Syria into Europe. So now the burden falls on Europe. 80% uh, of the operation should be European, maybe 20% of us. We're flipping the responsibilities. Great decision by the president to make sure ISIS doesn't come back, Iran doesn't fill in the vacuum, and you don't have a war between the Turkey and the Kurds who helped us. But, but in December, he didn't see it that way. You spoke to him last night. Well, what, so the, what, what changed his Well, mind? I've spoken to him continuously. I said, Mr. President, you deserve a lot of credit for destroying the caliphate. But we need an insurance policy to make sure they don't come back. And the Kurds who helped us in the eyes of Turkey, the YPG Kurds, are part of the PKK. We need a buffer zone between Turkey and the Syrian Democratic Forces so they don't go to war. You don't want to end one war and start another. We want to make sure ISIS never comes back. And Iran cannot get these oil fields that are in Syria. So by having a small U.S. presence will attract a lot of Europeans. It's time for the Europeans to take the lead here. And that's what this plan's about, is to put them in the lead with our help. Uh, he also, this decision comes on the heels of a meeting with Erdogan. Was yeah. something discussed in that that changed his mind as well? Well, I went to uh, Turkey and I told Erdogan, you're not going into Syria. If you go into Syria, you're going to create a war between the Arabs, uh, the Kurds, and the Christians inside Syria. They don't want Turkish troops coming in. The best thing we can do to help Turkey, and they have a legitimate national security concern, is a safe zone where the West... NATO plus 200 of us will keep the parties apart, watch ISIS, and make sure the Iranians with the Russians and Assad do not come in and take the oil. This is a very good plan. Trump deserves credit for using a small American force of 2,700. We've lost eight people in the last three years. God bless the eight. But this is the most successful model since 9-11. Indigenous forces, Kurds and Arabs doing the fighting with our help. This has worked, and I'm so glad we've adjusted. Had he not gone the way he did in December, do you think James Mattis would still have a job? I don't know, but I know that when Mattis left, we accelerated the effort to destroy the caliphate. I really like General Mattis, but it was time to get somebody new. The president really put the metal to the pedal to destroy the caliphate after Mattis left. Really within a month, we've destroyed the caliphate. Now we've got a residual force integrated with the Europeans to keep the peace, to make sure ISIS doesn't come back, and to check Iran. We've got a force down south. There's a superhighway from uh, Tehran to Beirut that the Iranians are using to flow weapons into Lebanon and Syria. We've got a garrison down there sitting on top of that highway. This is important for Israel. We have a post-caliphate strategy that is very well, small. It's a, it's well, a matrix, I, right, I, geographically. I it do is. want to ask you about this so quickly before we move on, because we had a reporter on earlier on our show talking about Iraq, and you haven't mentioned them. Uh, and he was talking about the number of ISIS fighters reportedly crossing over and ending up there. He said about 1,000 a month. That's why we keep our base in Iraq. So we're on both sides of the border. A couple of hundred people working with the, uh, the Europeans will keep Syria together. We have a bigger force in Iraq. We can jump across the border if we need to, and we can kill them when they come into Iraq. So President Trump has created a scenario where we can be safe with the other people in the region doing the fighting and our allies taking most of the burden. I support more people people doing more, we're doing less, but it is in our national security interest to hold this place together. The Kurds who helped us, we owe it to them to make sure they're not slaughtered. ISIS, we can't ever let them come back. And at the end of the day, Iran is uh, checkmated with this move by President Trump. Two more topics here. I got a long list, but only so much <laughs> okay. time. Um, what is your expectation for Chairman Kim and Hanoi, Vietnam? Next. This is sort of a, a, a relationship uh, being built. My expectations are to give up his nuclear weapons over time, to convince him that he is better off without a nuclear um, arsenal than he is with one. His nuclear weapons could fall in the hands of people who would actually use them if he would not. The president is right to want this uh, 
transition from a nuclear North Korea to a non-nuclear North Korea. The Japanese don't have nukes. South Korea don't have nukes. They don't have uh, nuclear weapons. So my hope is that we'll set a plan out over the next year or so where you can denuclearize and get the benefit of security and peace and stability in North Korea. We won't have a nuclear threat. Well, my question is, though, what would be involved in that plan such that we don't have the situation that we have in Iran? First thing you got to do is we're talking. Why is Kim talking to him? Why is the caliphate destroyed? Because Donald Trump has been a very good commander in chief. Uh, Chairman Kim's at the table because he's afraid of Trump. We broke the Iran nuclear agreement, which was putting Iran on a pathway to a nuclear weapon, and we destroyed the caliphate, and we got the Taliban at the table in Afghanistan. Why? Mm -hmm. We've been strong in the face of uh, adversity. Donald Trump has been the opposite of Barack Obama. The reason the Taliban's at the table, Kim's at the table, is Trump has shown strength. Now we've got to close the deal. Now's the time to close the deal. My expectation is you need to take something away from this. Now, the, S Singapore was a novelty. How are they going to greet each other? What we does need it a road look map like? from this. We need a road map of how this ends and when it ends. That's what okay. we need. Uh, border security, Democrats are pushing this resolution. <laughs> Will you vote with them when it comes before the Senate? What Absolutely not. I'm 100% with President. Uh, how many Republicans <clears throat> do you believe will vote with them? A handful, but here's the point. Uh, Trump sent troops to the border. Obama sent troops to the border. Bush sent troops to the border. What's the difference of deploying forces to the border to secure it versus having them build a barrier while they're there? Mm -hmm. I think he has all the power under a statute and as commander in chief to send troops to, to the border to actually erect barriers. We're safer with a, with a secure border. Nobody objected to Obama sending troops. What's the difference of a troop going to the border to guard the border versus building a barrier to make sure it stays uh, intact? Mm -hmm. I, I think he's got all the authority he needs, and uh, he, there will be enough to, to sustain a veto. And we allocate money to assist with building borders overseas. You know what uh, pisses me can, off can so much this, is so? that Democrats have voted in the past for $44 billion, $9 billion for barriers, and all of a sudden Trump's president, he, he gets a dollar. So this this hypocrisy is pretty stunning and I hope Dem hope Republicans will not reward this you, quite you, frankly. You seem to have, you've been mad for some time. Well you? I'm mad about this because I helped Obama. You know I voted for the Gang of Eight bill. I've sat down with Democrats to try to solve this problem on a Democrat's watch. Nobody suggested we did not need to secure the border. Nobody suggested this was a manufactured crisis on Obama's watch. So what's changed? They just hate Trump, and that does bother me. Last question. You speak with him a lot. Uh, you met with him <laughs> last when? Uh, a couple of days ago. Um, the Mueller matter could be out. Could yeah. be out this afternoon. Right. Could be out in two weeks. We'll see on that. Yeah. Michael Cohen's going to testify publicly next Wednesday. Right. The president's going to be overseas talking about nuclear war and negotiating I don't get a way that. out of it. I really don't understand. How, how do you think he is doing in your personal discussions with him? Uh, does he president? like the job? Does he enjoy it? What's the feedback? He is having a lot of fun being president and it's stressful and he's under siege he gets it every day from different directions but um, he's got a good sense of humor he knows what he wants to accomplish the Syrian decision shows he listens Obama would never listen General Obama turned out to be a bad general President Trump is actually listening to his military leaders yeah it, does he think they've taken a wrecking ball to his life yeah has it deterred him from being a focused president? No. Our economy is humming. Our military is stronger. Our enemies are on their back foot. Uh, I'm very pleased with what the president's doing. And I think the Mueller investigation will result in no evidence of collusion between Trump and the Russians. I really believe that. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Thanks, guys. Thank Senator Lindsey Graham. Nice I'll be in you. Reno next week. <laughs>